Thanks, everybody. Thanks for spending a little time with your Sunday afternoon. Um, again, my name is Hoku Johnson. I'm the Planning and Evaluation Coordinator. I work for NOAA, um, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And the program that I work for is actually the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And so with that, oh, turn this on. Oh, it's on. All right, here we go. So before I start, I always like to just give some kudos to some of the groups that support this program that we do, which is intertidal monitoring um, actually throughout the state of Hawaii and including the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, so the whole Hawaiian archipelago. And what I'm going to be doing today is presenting on actually presenting another researcher's research. It's Dr. Chris Bird with Texas A&M University at Corpus Christi. He couldn't be here today. He's actually coming in in a couple of days. Um, we're heading up to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands in a week and a half or so to do another um, intertidal monitoring trip. So he just missed this. But for those of you that are gonna be at the Hawaii Conservation Conference in early August in Hilo, we're gonna be doing a forum on intertidal monitoring at that. So if you're interested, check us out. So today, what I'm gonna talk a little bit about are everything Opihi and a lot intertidal. Um, talk a little bit about the distribution, the life history and the different species of Opihi in Hawaii. I will mention the statewide Opihi partnership, which is a great group of people representing different communities where we actually do this intertidal monitoring pretty regularly. And then I'll talk about some of the methodologies that we use to monitor the intertidal zone. And they're actually relatively easy for people to grasp and to do. And so we're trying to implement this monitoring in more communities across the Hawaiian archipelago. And then I am gonna do a little plug on the state of Opihi and the main Hawaiian islands, cause really there's not a lot of it. Uh, people love to eat Opihi and they're loving it to death and we're trying to bring it back. And so we have some management recommendations that I think for the past three or four years, we've gone to the state legislature to talk with them, to talk with the lawmakers about raising the minimum size limit um, for Opihi take. And then I'll talk, I have to talk about the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and what we do up there. And we have actually a specific cruise, or we call them a cruise, it sounds like a vacation, but it's actually a research trip that we do up to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands every year to do this intertidal monitoring. And it's just as casual, I'm a small group of people. So if you have questions, just let me know and I'll answer as we move through this. Um, in addition, and if you're interested, there's actually some opihi that I brought, not to eat, just the shells, um, that I brought that are up here. So you can kind of get an idea of what they look like. Um, they're a little bit different um, in terms of morphology than a lot of the Opihi in the main Hawaiian islands. They're more peaked and so I'll pass those out in a little bit. So when I before I knew anything about Opihi other than just knowing that it tasted good and I liked it to go pick it, um, I didn't realize that I thought Opihi was just endemic to the Hawaiian islands, the Hawaiian archipelago. But the genus Solana is actually distributed widely throughout the world ranging from Hawaii all the way to the one of the coast, um, the east coast of Africa. There's actually Opihi around the world. It's just not the same genus. Um, I know, and you, you folks may have heard of getting Opihi from Ireland. It tastes very similar. It's a cold water species. It's not from the genus Solana, but um, Opihi is everywhere. It is pretty unique that Hawaii, or not Hawaiians, but people in Hawaii eat Opihi and they consider it a d delicacy. There's not a lot of places that I've heard of people actually harvesting opihi. So you'll go to other places, like I've been to Indonesia where there's limpets on the rocks and like ask the local people, do you eat this? And they're like, no. So I thought that was interesting. So going back to Hawaii, there are actually three different species of opihi and opihi are patellogastropods or limpets. There are, are th three species again. The one that lives underwater and is considered the biggest opihi is Solana talcosa which is also called opihi koele. That's the Hawaiian word for opihi. Everyone, I think local people know it as the kneecap opihi because it's pretty big. Um, I actually went to someone's house on Molokai a couple of years ago and they showed me this opihi that was a uh, koele opihi and it was probably bigger than my hand. You could, it was like a little bowl. And they said they had picked this on, on Molokai a really, really long time ago. So that was kind of neat to see. Um, and then there's uh, two other species of opihi. Um, Solana sanwisensis, opihi, opihi alina lina, and then Solana exarata, which is the blackfoot opihi, or opihi makaio uli. And just because there's three species of opihi, they're actually not all found throughout the Hawaiian archipelago. The three species are, for the most part, located in the, what, we, what I call the main Hawaiian islands, or the populated Hawaiian islands, or the southeastern Hawaiian islands. Um, blackfoot opihi, so makaio uli, 
Yellowfoot Opihi, Alina Lina, and Koele are all found in the main Hawaiian islands. We don't have any data from Ni'ihau. We haven't been able to do intertidal monitoring there. We hope to in the future, um, but so we don't really know if Opihi Koele is there, but we're kind of assuming it is because it is found on Kauai, even though it's very rare there. So if you move up the island chain to Nihoa and Mokumanamana in the Papahanaumokuakea Kea Marine National Monument in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, there's only two species of Opihi found up there. And those are the Yellowfoots and the Blackfoots. We're not totally ruling out the potential for um, Koele there, but just haven't seen it. And they're pretty noticeable because they live underwater. So P are actually zoned out vertically. Um, the species live in certain zones on the rocks, on the shoreline. Um, this is a boulder shoreline, I think, at Kalaupapa might be, or Hana, I can't remember. Um, but again, Koele lives underwater. Um, that's the kneecap opihi. The yellowfoot opihi, which is the one that most local people consider kind of the most yummy one, lives in the splash zone in an area that always will be wet. And then you have the blackfoot opihi, which is the higher one, Makayo Uli. And that opihi usually lives in the highest zone that will sometimes temporarily dry out. And so the easiest way to monitor is to really just block off those zones. It's um, one way we do it when we do it like when we do a quick rapid assessment that i'll be talking about is we basically if the rock is pink if it's that crustose rock that's where all the yellow photopihi live that's still a wet area if the rock is black it's the basalt rock that's usually where the blackfoots are and then anything underwater is going to be like straight underwater definitively underwater is going to be the opihi koele so a little bit about the life cycle life history of opihi Usually, so what they do is they basically spawn, so they'll release sperm and eggs into the water, and very quickly, the opihi, the larva turn into what we call a trochophore. So within 18 hours, it's already this really tiny microscopic larvae that has little cilia and it'll kind of swim. They don't go really fast, though. Within 72 hours, that's, that turns into a villager, which will, you'll start to see the foot, and this is, again, all microscopic, so you'll start to see the foot. And then within 120 hours, that opihi will actually settle back onto the shoreline. Um, and we call that a settler. Within a year, at least in the main Hawaiian islands, opihi will grow, eat, uh, grow large enough to be considered, I guess, what you would call an adult. And when I say within a year, large enough is the minimum size limit to actually take. So that's 31 millimeters or about an inch and a quarter. And that's the shell size. So that's the legal size limit to actually take opihi in Hawaii um, to harvest opihi. In the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, they actually mature faster. Um, they, they get big a lot faster. So I'll talk more about that, but essentially they're not, a, it doesn't take a very long time for them to actually grow and mature and to be full adults, which is good because there's hope to kind of bring opihi back um, relatively quickly. So again, these are just some pictures, the trochophore and the villager, those are the pelagic phase, and then eventually it'll settle out. And I guess these are pictures of the yellowfoot opihi or opihi alina lina. And then you see the little guy there on a transplant tile, just a little settler. Within two months, you can see them. Um, you can see the little tiny guys. Some of you may have heard of opihi ava, which is actually another species of opihi that isn't really eaten because it's really bitter and they're very small, but they kind of look like that. And then within a year, what we consider an adult. I think this is also yellowfoot. So in addition to just being really yummy to eat um, for everyone who's been able to eat opihi and find it, opihi are obviously an important food source, but there's actually a more a Native Hawaiian cultural significance to opihi. There's documented uh, records of opihi actually being amokua. Like when you think of amokua, or at least I do, I think of the shark or a seabird or a honu or something like that. But amokua can be in the forms of a lot of different things. It can even be, you know, weather phenomenons like rain or rainbows. Um, Opihi is, is an Amokua, and you, we found a lot of this information at Bishop Museum when families in like South Kona, like Ka'u, were, were referring to their Amokua as Opihi. So that, that was interesting, just kind of the, you know, the, the symbology of the Opihi and it, the fact that it can steadfastly kind of cling to the rocks and the strength in that. Um, so that's just an interesting thing. And then in addition, there's a lot of Olelo no Ea or Hawaiian proverbs about Opihi. And opihi was also used not just to eat, but the shells have been used as scrapers for coconut, lots of jewelry. People like opihi necklaces and earrings, and they shine them and buff them out and all of that. And you'll find opihi in middens and archaeological middens everywhere, um, mountains and mountains of them. 
And so, you know, just knowing that OP isn't something new that we came upon and went, oh, that tastes good. Let's eat it. I mean, it's OP has been eaten and used for a long, long time. You see, little kid there with all that OP stoked. So moving on a little bit more to the statewide OPE partnership and part of what I do and part of what a lot of people do now, it actually started in 2008 and it started right before a group of scientists was preparing to go to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands on a, we call it like a piggyback. They were a little project on a bigger trip up to the monument. Um, and they met, this group of scientists met in Hana, Maui, and they started talking about what the issues were for the communities in Hana and their resources. Because a lot of those folks that live in kind of more rural communities, you know, they're more subsistence liver, you know, subsist they live a subsistence lifestyle. So they started talking about the shoreline and how to better manage their shoreline. And what was born out of this conversation is what we now call the statewide OPE partnership. And now it's involved over 13 different communities. And the cool thing about this is that the data collected within each community's kind of backyard is actually owned by them. And so in order for the scientists to use the data, in order for me to talk here today, I had to get approval from all of these guys to use their information. So they own it, they hold it, it's theirs, we keep it confidential. And the reason being is OP here really easy, easy to get. Um, as long as the waves are relatively low, you can go in there and do what we call pound OP. You can just rip them right off the rocks and just take them all. And so if people know where they are, <laughs> then they're gonna be gone. And so we try to keep that, we take that confidentiality really seriously. And so these are, this isn't an, an exhaustive list, but these are a whole bunch of people, different organizations, ranging from really small community organizations to you know, the University of Hawaii system, um, DLNR, the National Park System, my office, NOAA, Koholawe Island Reserve Commission. All of these guys are part of this partnership. You know, Some are more involved than others, but they all are part of this. And we try to meet relatively regularly to plot our future you know takeover of trying to bring opihi back in the main hawaiian islands um and i just put a flyer in there because this just happened in kipahulu on east maui there was an opihi monitoring um day over there and so they use you know a lot of the community comes out they grab their data sheets and their buckets and their transects and they go on there do their opihi monitoring record all the data and send the data back they keep the data but they also send the information to their scientist chris bird and you know he takes all of that and so it works out really really cool really well i think the nature conservancy helped with that one so now i'm going to talk a little bit about the methodologies that we use when we monitor the intertidal zone um, there are three different things that we use we use transects to monitor we actually do something called a rapid assessment where we basically just count the opihi quickly and then we also do something that was born out of um more of a cultural way of looking at things, which is basically recording observational data, weather, weather data, what the animals are doing that day when we're monitoring Opihi, what the tides are like and all of that. So I'll go into a little more detail about that. So these are where we've surveyed. Um, these are the sites that we've surveyed in the Hawaiian archipelago. So you'll see there's three sites on Hawaii Island. And this is a little old, so I want to say there's a couple more on each of these islands. We've, we grow pretty fast. Um, we've, we've done monitoring even on Koho Olave, which is, which was really interesting to monitor, do OPE monitoring in an intertidal zone that had unexploded ordnance like sticking out of it. We made it happen, nothing blew up. Um, we only have one site on Oahu and that's largely because there's not a lot of OPE on Oahu. On Kauai, two sites and going all the way up. This year, kind of a cool thing is in a couple weeks, um, me and a bunch of the OPE monitoring folks are gonna get to go to Lehua Rock and do some monitoring there, which will be great. We really like to get on the Ihao, but the access issue there is a little complicated. So we're gonna keep working on that. And we've gone all the way up to Gardner Pinnacles, which on this map is the Hawaiian word is Puha Honu, which is the, the most Northern tiny little basalt island in the Hawaiian archipelago. So that's where the basalt stops is at Gardner Pinnacles. And it's literally a rock that's like half of this building maybe or less. It's very, very small. Um, all in all, 10 islands, definitely more than 700 transects, and we've definitely spent more than 500 man hours on the transect. That's a little bit old. So what do we do? And I have pictures of what the transects look like. So we basically take a bronze chain and we measure out the shoreline. I think it's in five meter incre increments. We take a bronze chain and we run it from Malka to Makai on the shoreline. So we look for the highest marine invertebrate, which is usually PPP, which I think a lot of you know what PPP is, those little tiny um, nerite snails. 
We'll start there and they're, they like to live really high. And we'll go all the way down into the subtitle zone. And then we'll mark with colored cable ties each of the zones of Opihi by the species of Opihi. So Blackfoot, there's usually a little bit of an overlap zone with the Blackfoot and the Yellowfoot. And then same thing with the Yellowfoot and the Koele, and then down to the Koele. And we'll literally, we'll have three people on the transect, one person's recording the data, and the other two are measuring, or measuring and monitoring, they're counting everything. And so we do measure the size of Opihi species specifically, but we count everything. So we count, if a crab runs across a transect, we count them. If, um, if there's limu or algae on the transect, we will try to identify it as much as possible and estimate the cover, um, the percent coverage in the zone that we're measuring it in. And so we have a little PVC pipe that's about 50 centimeters long and we'll run it across the transect. And usually one person will count one side and one person will count the other side or one person will go Malka and one person will stay Makai and we'll just rip through that transect. And it takes, like I think I said earlier, about 45 minutes for the more complicated ones and maybe like 15 for the ones that just don't, you know, there's just not a lot of stuff on them. And after that, what we'll do is we'll take pictures down each transect to document it. We'll measure out the area, we'll measure rugosity, we'll do a bunch of different measurements and then we'll move on. And so that's one way oops, of actually measuring. And so here's some pictures of what that looks like. You can see the PVC pipe and the colored cable ties on the upper left hand, what is that? Yeah, upper left hand corner. Um, and then you'll see the transect chain and the data collectors and then the, the two guys monitoring. And then it can get kind of involved depending on where you are. Um, some places a little more difficult than others. We'll usually actually also have somebody who doesn't do any of this, who just watches for waves and they'll yell out and kind of count down because it, it can be, it can be kind of dangerous. We've been in a couple of situations where we've, we've been like, Whoa, that was, that was scary. Um, but you can see the guys laying down, kind of going under the cliff to make sure they get everything on the transect. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's how we do the transect work. Other species, like I mentioned, that we count, we do everything. So hot uki uki, which is the helmet, the shingle urchin, sorry, the shingle urchin there on the bottom. If coral is in the subtitle zone, we'll try our best to ID it. We'll try our best to record it and make sure there's a note of that. Uh, the other things we, we monitor are those pupu ava is the Hawaiian name for them. I forget the scientific name. But those are the snails that actually prey on opihi or one of the snails that prey on opihi. And then we'll also look at the algae. And so on the trips to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, we do try to bring a phycologist or a limu expert to identify some of this. But in reality, a lot of limu needs to be identified. I know you talked about limu, I think last week. Needs to, you need to really look at a microscope. And you know, Dr. Izzy Abbott, who was the master taxonomist, you know, she passed away, but she was the one that we would always send our samples to. And so we still send some of these samples to the University of Hawaii for identification because we don't even, I mean, we can't, you just visually can't ID it. Even if you're, even the phycologist gets confused sometimes, but it's kind of neat to see how much different kind of limo is up there and the difference between the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and limo species in the main Hawaiian Islands. So this is our data sheet. This is the sheet that we use for the transect work. So not only do we deal with Opihi, but we got all these other things that we monitor. And then we also record just a little bit about the weather, you know, where the waves high, what kind of habitat are we in? Are we in a boulder habitat? Are we in a, call it a pulley or a cliff kind of habitat, which is what it would be out here in Hanama Bay. And then we just go at it and we will, we'll just do this over and over and over again. And, you know, try and get as many of these in as we can. <clears throat> so that's one method. The second method is a lot easier. Um, it doesn't involve pretty much anything except for one data recorder, a clicker, like, the clicker used to count people when you, they go through the door like a movie theater, um, and then a ruler, and that's it. And so the way we do this is the whole group of people will stand in the, like in the intertidal zone, we'll all spread our arms out, and we will count everything within our arm span. Everything from Malka, from the highest Opihi, all the way to the Makai, so all the way underwater if it's, if it's a Koele zone. And once we count everything and we size everything, we'll yell it to the data recorder, and then we'll leapfrog to the front of the line and do it again. And so in certain places, this is not a good example, but <laughs> this, is, this is a lot harder. This is actually, I think, at Mokumanamana, this picture. But in a lot of places, there's just not a lot of Opihi. So in the main Hawaiian Islands, you can get almost an exact count of what's there um, relatively quickly. And so it's kind of neat to be able to compare and contrast and get an estimate of an area. There is a, there are two small basalt pinnacles in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands that don't have a lot of Opihi on them. And we, um, we can count every single one. 
And I think every year it's about 27 to 2800 OPE that we count every single year. And that's interesting because we can just quickly know the population's, you know, stable, is it declining, what's going on? And it takes us, I don't even think it takes us a day to do that. So this is another method that we use. Um, we're trying to graduate towards actually using iPads or some kind of a tablet system where there is no pencil and paper anymore. And actually not just for this rapid count, but for the transect count, where you can just go boop, 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 and just record everything. And so we have a researcher, um, his name is John Burns of the University of Hawaii at Hilo, who's working on some of that, which is kind of cool. So we'll test it out and see if it works. And then, so this is, these are just pictures of that rapid assessment. Um, depending on where we are, some of the shoreline you can't walk, so you have to actually swim. So we'll do our, go like this, we'll try, you know, we'll communicate to the, each person on each side. Oh, you're going to count over there to that little limu thing. And you're going to count to that little point. Okay, cool. And we'll just count it and then we'll jump back in the water and we'll swim around and go to the next one. So it's kind of fun, actually. It's a good workout. And then I think you see, that's Chris Bird, the scientist on the bottom left, um, or on the bottom right. He has, he has his goggles on. He's floating on a little bird and he has his GPS that he's taking GPS points for everything. Or is his phone? I can't remember. And then the last thing that we do, so there's, there's the rapid, there's the transects, and then we also do the huli is what we call it. These are observational records. So at the end of each day, we'll get everyone together and we'll basically sit down and talk about what we saw that day. And we'll go everywhere from the heavens or the clouds all the way down to what's underwater and what's there, what's in season, what kind of fish do we see? What are the birds doing with each other? You know, do we see anything on land? What's blooming? What's in season? And all of that information is actually going into a database. Um, there's a group called the Mako'o Papahanamoko'okea. They're taking all this information and they're trying to create a database that we can go back into and look at spawning and look at interactions with animals and kind of reference, you know, every time we go into a community, reference what happened before. And so we're just, we're at the be kind of beginning of this. They're trying to figure out database stuff, but it's a cool way to get everyone, especially the scientists, head out of just the transect or just the OPE to get them up to have them kind of look around and be really aware of their surroundings. It's definitely done that. And it's a good way to get everyone together and kind of close the day out and have this discussion. And then it's kind of just, a, it's good closure um, for the day. And so we do this every time, at least in the, um, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into some more scientific information about OPE populations in the Hawaiian archipelago and then some management recommendations that we've, we kind of continue to push and I'll try to stay off my soapbox. <laughs> so this isn't news that OPE populations crashed a long time ago. Um, there's just not the OPE that, I mean, even, you know, even when I was a kid, I remember seeing a lot more OPE, at least on Oahu than I do now. And so that's, that's a fact. There's just, there's not a lot of OPE. It's hard to get it. The OPE that you would buy, um, like at, uh, um, what's the fish place? Not tomorrow's, the other one. Taniokas. That would probably come from the Big Island. Um, that's probably where that comes from. It might come from Molokai on the backside. I'm on the North Shore of Molokai. But, you know, you're definitely not getting that OPE. It's not Oahu OPE. Unless you can get access to the airport runway or get access to the Kaniohe Marine Base. Um, not a lot of OPE. It's also a lot more expensive now to buy it. Other indications of decline? There's not a lot of OPE in places that are obviously accessible, like Lihue, Kauai, for example. Also for, um, yeah, I mean, pl pretty much anywhere that you can walk down to, you're not going to find OPE because people can just get there and pound them. And then like in North Kohala, same thing. You will see a lot of OPE on the east side of the Big Island, and that's because the habitat there is very dangerous. And there's also something called Hawaii Volcanoes National Park that keeps people out, and there's lots of lava, and it's dangerous and scary, and the OPE are protected there. So going into densities, again, I actually just mentioned the Big Island. So this is the Blackfoot OPE. Obviously, there's a lot of it in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Mostly that's because you need a permit to go there. It's expensive to get there. They're remote. It's protected. Nobody goes there. Um, not a lot from Maui to, <clears throat> to Kauai, excuse me. Still have some on Hawaii Island. Same thing for the Yellowfoot OPE. This is the one that everyone likes to eat, that they look for, that they ask about. Alina Lina, there is definitely some on Hawaii Island. Koh Olave has some, Maui, I'm guessing that's the Hana side, the Kipuhulu side of Maui, the east side, and then the rest of the, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, we still have Alina Lina. Not so much on Oahu and Kauai. Koele even worse, but that's the big one. Um, I actually saw Opihi Koele on sale at KTA not that long ago, and they were pretty big, and 
yeah, in Hilo, and it's just a, it's a bummer because there's just not a lot of them. So factors affecting OP populations. Obviously, human harvest, that is a big one. That's the biggest one for sure. Predation, and I don't mean by people, again, just the predatory animals that eat OP. So there are snails in the intertidal zone. Like that's a picture right there of one. He'll crawl up on the OP and he'll drill a hole in it. And then the OP has a mechanism where they basically take their tentacles and they fold them up around their shell and they push the snail off. Or they can actually sense the snail coming. So they'll start to like run, which they don't really run fast, but they'll be like, you know, like trying to run away from the snail. It's kind of cool. We have some YouTube. You can actually go on YouTube and find it. I'm sure people have posted them there. They'll like pick a predatory snail in the inner tiles and put it near an OP just to watch the thing run around. Um, and actually, we, we've actually used predatory snails to try and ID OP because the tentacles of the blackfoot OP are different than the tentacles of the yellowfoot OP. So in places like Mokumanamana or Necker Island in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, it's very hard visually to tell the difference between the two. Um, it's, it's just, we get into fights about it all the time. Is that a yellowfoot or a blackfoot? I don't know, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's really confusing. So if we take a predatory snail and we drop it on top of the OP, then he'll, he'll defend himself quickly. He's not harmed. He'll defend himself. He'll throw the snail off and they'll be like, oh, yellowfoot, done. Um, it doesn't always work, but most of the time it does. And then other issues are more with the OP biology. So OP spawn, they're relative, they're not, they're broadcast spawners, but their, their larva doesn't go all over the world. So an OP that spawns and settles out in Hawaii Island isn't going to release its eggs when it grows up and, and spawn out and have OP on Kauai. That they're, they're more local than that. Big Island, Maui, Molokai, all connected gen gen genetically. Oahu and Kauai are connected, but Oahu and Mokumanamana are not. And so because of that, if you have a place like Oahu that doesn't have any OP, it's gonna have it's gonna be really hard to get them to come back. Yeah. And so well, I'll talk more about Oahu later on. So basically just the biology of the OP just makes it hard for it to um, to come back once big populations are, are gone. Which is why Hanama Bay is important, because there's still OP here. So that's good as long as we keep the lifeguards in check here. Okay, anyway, moving on. Opihi mature at different sizes. Um, so Alina Lina and Makayo Uli. Do I have Koala in here too? Okay. So in restricted areas like the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands or Hanama Bay or other like deep default restricted areas like military bases, the airport runway, Opihi actually mature at a smaller size. So they can actually spawn at a smaller size versus in unrestricted areas that you can just access and go grab Opihi. They actually mature, they spawn when they're bigger. And so that's a problem when the law is you can take OPE once it hits a 31 millimeter shell length, right? Or an inch and a quarter shell length. You can take them because in the main Hawaiian islands, a lot of times you can take OPE that probably haven't ever, ever spawned. So that's just whacking them more. Um, so that'll lead to what do we got here? Oh yeah. So that's my next, I trumped myself there. OPE may not spawn before reaching legal harvest size. So we, we know that now. I mean, Basically, in the main Hawaiian Islands, you take an opihi that's legal harvest size. Well, a lot of people just take under, undersized ones too, but it probably didn't spawn, and you're just you're just putting a dent into the population, and it's making it a lot harder for them to come back. So the, I just put this in as an example of so northwestern Hawaiian Islands opihi, northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So that's what the intertidal zone looks like, at least for the opihi side of things in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. I didn't put all the colorful pictures of the limo and all that. Um, and then you got Oahu. I mean, that's, it's kind of a rough comparison, but I mean, because there's none there, right? So that's what, that's what we look at. Um, if I go on to Necker Island or Nihua and I put my arms out, I can count between 500 and 1,000 OPE, right, in one wingspan. Versus Oahu, you go, even on this shoreline, you stand on Hanama Bay, you go like this, is maybe there's 10. So just to show, trying to compare and contrast, you know, what we're looking at. So... Management recommendations. I talked a lot about raising that minimum size limit. We'd like to raise it. In addition to that, we're working on, at least the researchers are working on, um, looking into seasonal heart ways to limit the harvest by season. And so that's a little harder because different species of opihi, depending on where they are, spawn at different times. And it's a lot more complicated than just being like, oh, just like lobster, you know, you can't take them from whatever it is made of 
I don't know what the season is, but you know, there's like a set season versus OPE. It's a lot more complicated. So they're looking into some of that. Um, and then this is something that everyone freaks out about, but I mean, there's not a lot of OPE on Oahu. Why don't we just make it illegal to take OPE temporarily and see if that will start to recover the OPE populations on Oahu, right? So you have areas that are restricted to access. Those OPE can spawn out. And what they'll wind up doing is they will settle out in areas that aren't restricted. So if we just stop taking OPE on Oahu, just shut it all down. Let's see what will happen. They'll probably come back. It's going to take a little while, but that's what the scientists are thinking is that just shut it down on Oahu, you know, and leave it there. I think he was saying, Dr. Bird was saying maybe three to five years. And let's, let's see if we'll start to see the recovery of OPE. In addition, obviously, no take areas are always a good thing. And then having bag limits are always a good thing too. Those are harder to enforce, but you know, it's something you can always look into. And then this is a picture of a, of a little kid. Um, I think this is Hana Maui. And he, if you go to Hana or if you go to Kipahula, there's signs up now that the community's put up. So this isn't DLNR, this isn't like NOAA, this isn't anyone that's doing this. This is a community that's just like, you know what? We don't like people coming in from the outside and taking our OPE. We want to manage our own backyard and we're going to self-police this. And so they didn't get approval from anyone to do this. They just did it. And it's actually working. Um, they started putting these signs out like a couple years ago. And they're seeing, they're seeing the community really respect these signs. I mean, small community, right? So I know you. I saw you down on the shoreline pounding all the OP. Like, I'm going to tell your dad or whatever. I mean, that's, it, it works, though. And people from the outside have actually respected this as well. So not a lot of scientific data on this one, but they are looking into kind of recording that. So the monitoring from here on out in these areas on the east side of Maui is going to be even more important now. So again, size limit, what we would recommend would be to increase the size limit for the Blackfoot and the Yellowfoot Opihi to 45 millimeters, which is bigger. And then at least that would guarantee the fact that they would spawn before they were taken, right? And then for Koele, because they tend to be adults at a bigger size, we'd increase the size limit for Koele even bigger. And these are just recommendations. I mean, this is just, you know, this is just the people that love OPE and want to keep eating them, you know, thinking about what we could do based on the data that we've collected. Okay, last part of my presentation. I had to talk about this because I work for this place. Um, the annual intertidal monitoring trip that we do to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands that I will be going, I think it's on next week, on the 25th of June for a couple of weeks up there. So basically, the, the intertidal zone in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands is very poorly characterized. We know more about the deep, deep ocean up there, actually, than we do about our rocky shorelines, which we found very interesting as managers. So what to remedy this, what we started to do was have some scientists come up and do what we call a piggyback trip on a bigger, on a NOAA ship, which is part, usually for the first couple of years was part of a bigger trip. So some, a small group of scientists, I think it was four, went up in 2009 and then a little bit larger group in 2010 to monitor Opihi in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And so they did the transects and they did the data observations and they did the rapid at that time wasn't even around, but they did the transect work. And then because of that, and because of what we were finding, we started getting intrigued about, well, you know, maybe we should, maybe this should be like our annual coral reef monitoring cruise. We have intertidal shoreline stuff. We have coral reef monitoring. And then now they're starting to explore the mesophotic zone, which is the deeper coral reefs. Let's continue to do this. And so we jointly funded an annual, we, we jointly fund an annual cruise dedicated to monitoring the intertidal zone. So I don't know if you, you folks watch like Hawaii Five-0 or have watched Lost, but the searcher is the boat that we use. It's a boat that's in those shows. Um, we, we charter that boat and we go up there. It's, we don't dive, obviously, so it's a small boat. It's perfect for what we do. And um, we've done this for the past, we're going on five years now. So 2015 will be the fifth year. And usually we spend a couple weeks up there. We only work on the basalt islands. So there's 10 islands in the monument, but there's only a couple that have actual OP. Um, so we work there and those are the south, the south part of the monument. And usually it would take about 10 people and that'll include researchers, but also cultural practitioners and marine managers. We'll also take, what we try to do is take community people from like Hana and Kipahulu. We've taken people from Kalapana, from Kalaupapa, from Koho'olawe or managers on Koho'olawe, um, like the west side of Kona. We've taken all kinds of people up there. So they can get a good idea of what, what the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands looks like versus what their community looks like. And not just Opihi, but everything. I mean, the birds, the fish, and it's really interesting to see them talk or to hear them talk about, you know, the differences and the similarities. Um, and it's great to expose them to the place because not a lot of people get to go up to the monument. So here's the crew. Every year we've done it. Yeah. 
So we had a big group in 2010, but they didn't all monitor OPE. That was on one of the NOAA ships. But yeah, here's all of us every single year. Yeah, so the purpose of the trip is really, it's twofold. It's to better understand Popohanamokuakea's rocky shoreline, but also to reconnect with our Kupuna Island. So we do cultural protocol up there. We do chants. Um, it's a very spiritual place. It's, um, it's definitely some place that you want to respect and, and not kind of, you know, misbehave. Um, it's also in the middle of nowhere. So you really want to watch yourself too, because there is no like, the Coast Guard is not going to come for you if you get hurt up there. You have to like really be hurt for them to come. So anyway, it's a, it's a, it gives um, the Hawaiian community a chance to reconnect, which is, which is really special. So how we select them, I mean, it's kind of a no brainer. You know, you have to be able to handle the ocean. It's very scary up there. There's a lot of sharks and a lot of ulua and just things that'll bite you. Um, the shoreline is, is difficult. You know, they need to have the species knowledge. So they need to be able to know what is in the inner tidal zone and be able to identify it. Even if it's just the Hawaiian name, that's totally fine. Um, and then the ability to live on a boat, you know, everyone tells me, I want to go on this trip, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh yeah, you get seasick. Nah, I don't get seasick. And then they all get seasick. So, you know, it's like, you really gotta like, no, really, you know, so the ability to live on a boat and be okay with that. And then the ability to be out of reach and we don't have internet or we have very limited internet, very limited cell phones. Uh, there's no cell phone service, but very limited satellite phones. So that usually is a thing that'll kill people like that. Oh, I can't get my Facebook. I can't call my kids every night. Ah, no, then you don't want to do this trip. Um, this is what we do. I talked about it already. One of the um, other things that we're working on are the near shore fish survey. So, you know, the intertidal zone, what fish communities are right in that, in that splash zone. Um, we see a lot of wrasses in the tide pools and things like that, but what, what are the things that are right off the cliff, right in that wash area, you know, and how we're trying to figure out a way to accurately monitor or record what those are. Um, we're narrowing it down, but it's a lot harder when you're on snorkel and you have a clipboard and you're like this, and there's a wall of rock right there. And, you know, how accurate is that data? So we're, we're kind of doing a trial and everything with that. Um, here's more pictures of just what that looks like. And I think that's one guy doing the fish survey, I'm trying to work that out. Yes, and they have hard hats on and that's because at Nihua there's big sea cliffs and the rocks fall. And so we actually do wear hard hats at Nihua. And I, I heard they wear hard hats in Club Papa too, I think when they do Opihi monitoring. And I don't know why, I've never been down there. Um, preliminary res results from last year, La Perouse Pinnacles, which is one of the more northern basalt pinnacles in the monument, we observed juvenile OPE, which, like, who cares? But it, at La Perouse Pinnacle, all of the OPE look like this. Every single last one. So they're big and they're really peaked like this. And they're really fragile, actually. And we have never seen the small guys. And so this past year we did, which was a big deal for us. Um, there's not a lot of the big guys up there and to see them settling out was really neat. Um, and we've gone the same time every year. So we just thought that was an interesting observation. We counted less than 3000 OP at La Perouse and like, yeah, who cares, whatever. But you know, for a manager, for a Marine manager like myself, we get a lot of requests from, from people to go up to the monument. It's cool. There's, you know, it's like wild and all of that. And they want to film and they want to go walk around and they want to do these things. But because I know that the Opihi are fragile up there and there's not that many of them and they're really unique, um, their morphology is really unique. If a, if a videographer wanted to go and mess around at La Perouse, I'd probably give them a permit, but I'd tell them, you know what, stay away from the, the intertidal zone. Just, you don't need to be there. You know, if there's a compelling reason, then maybe we can talk about it, but you know, let's just stay off of there for now. Um, the appearance of hybridization at Mokumanamana is really interesting. <laughs> We're seeing, and I talked a little bit about that, you know, the, the Blackfoot and the Yellowfoots are genetically, with the genetic work, are actually starting to turn into one species, which, I mean, very preliminarily. And so Chris Bird is gonna publish a paper on this. It's something very unique. Um, and it's, yeah, it's interesting. And I probably shouldn't be talking about this because he's got to publish his paper, but whatever, he doesn't care. Um, and then we always look, we always go up there and look, especially at Nihua. Um, you know, Nihua's not that far away from Kauai. People with a boat could get there if they wanted to. There's nobody sitting on Nihua with a shotgun, like, get off my island. I mean, you could go and, like, pound a ton of OPD up there. But we haven't found any evidence of that. Um, we haven't found any evidence of people being up there illegally, luckily, knock on wood. Um, and then we haven't found any evidence of disease in any way. So that's good. We always go to look for that. And then the other thing that I'm not supposed to say, but it'll come out in a press release in a couple of weeks, I think, is that at Nihua, 
the Opihi are very genetically diverse, the two different Opihi species. And Chris, Dr. Bird is calling it the genetic Fort Knox of Opihi. And so, you know, like who really cares? But at the end of the day, you know, if there were to be some sort of a catastrophic, catastrophic disease outbreak, or if, um, you know, with climate change and ocean acidification and all of that, we have a almost repository for genetic diversity for those OPE species at Nihua. There's a lot of them up there. And apparently if you look at the genes, they're awesome. And so Chris is gonna go crazy with this paper. He's probably gonna talk about this at the Hawaii Conservation Conference, but he mentioned that the other day to me on the phone. And I was like, well, I'll put that in my presentation. Okay, so it's my last slide. Um, so basically, you know, if we want healthy intertidal ecosystems in the populated Hawaiian Islands, we do need to better manage our Opihi populations. And Opihi do have symbiotic relationships with other species in the monument, I mean, in the, in the intertidal zone. You know, they eat limu, they and hauke the, um, the shingle urchin have a really funny relationship with each other. So, you know, you gotta make sure that everything is healthy. And Opihi, of all the species in the intertidal zone, Opihi are the most popular, they're tasty, they're easiest to get picked. So we got to make sure that we conserve those guys in order to make the whole system work. Um, we'd like to see the minimum size limit raise eventually. I think we'll get there. It's just taking a while. Um, you know, we'll just have to deal with that. And then considering seasonal harvest restrictions, potentially bag limits, and even a temporary moratorium of even taking any OPE on a walk. Um, that would be awesome. In addition, it's always good. And we're going to continue to characterize and monitor the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. That area is considered pristine. It's a pristine habitat. I don't like to use that word, but there's a lot of OPE up there. The, the intertidal ecosystem appears very robust. So what we learn up there, we can always apply down here in terms of what happens up there. You know, all the genetic work that Chris is doing, he's studying gene flow of OPE throughout the Hawaiian islands. So it's really, really interesting and it's important to continue to monitor up there. And so I think that is it. Yeah. So thank you very much again for coming today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. Yes. Uh, anybody doing any uh, aspect of work with aquaculture? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so I cannot remember the name of the scientists at UH, but there are a couple of researchers who have tried to grow OPE, um, like in an aquaculture setup captively. And they haven't been able to fully close that life cycle of doing it. And we think it's because of the way of the, just the water flow of getting that whole, you know, OPE live in a zone that's continuously moving with water. It's not like fish where, you know, they just kind of swim around. So that's really difficult to nail down. They have tried it though. Um, I think they tried it. One of the researchers I remember tried it maybe like 10 years ago. And then there was another guy that was trying to do it more recently. But they haven't been able to fully, they're trying though. They're trying to do that. Yeah, they haven't fully been able to close that life cycle though. That would be great. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, that picture, it looked like somebody got a whole bunch of opinion and turned it so you can see that skin more flesh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, is that good to keep it up like that when you dry it out? Or? Yeah, so, um, no, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, you can pick them and you can turn them over and look at them and then you can put them back and they'll fasten back on the rocks. But because um, of the work that we do, the researcher actually has to collect some. So he'll, so the one, that picture, I don't know where it is, but the picture that you saw was probably one that we eventually would have to kill um, because he has to basically take the gonads of the reproductive organs of the OPE. He also has to look at the shell and then he has to take a piece of the foot and what he does with the foot is he spools out the DNA and he's learning about kind of the genetic structure of them. And so it's not a lot. I think we permit him to take like 20 at each site. He, we basically, he wanted to take a whole bunch and we were like, no, you got to narrow it down to the minimum that you can make your research statistically significant. So yeah. And then it doesn't go to waste. He just has to take the foot and the gonads and then we'll eat the rest. I mean, we don't like throw it overboard and waste it. Yeah. It sucks to me. <laughs> Yeah. I want to have a dumb question, but will they uh, will they eat some of the invasive algae? Yeah, you know, I that's a good question. Um, they're turf grazers, so they'll eat the turf algae that's on the rocks. But if you're looking at like mudweed or something like that, that's not something that Opihi would eat. Yeah, but if there is an invasive, if there is an invasive algae that's a turf algae, they'll eat it. Oh yeah, they'll eat it. Yeah. 
that same picture, the bottom picture, where you were explaining that if a snail gets on top of the whole piece, mm -hmm. it will bring up tentacles. Mm -hmm. I should put a picture Does of it. Does it know that it's a oh, snail? There. What if you just put your hand there, will it bring its tentacles out to try to push a hand off? No, it knows. It will know. And I don't know what it is that the predatory snail gives off, but it, oh yeah, they, you can even put a, like, you can put them a foot apart and that'll be, he will start running. I mean, running, but he'll, he'll move. And it's, it's, it's very um, interesting to capture on video. It's funny. I mean, it's horrible. We're torturing the OPE, but you know, I mean, we, we take the snail away and throw it back in the, where it was supposed to be, but yeah, they'll, um, and then what they'll try and do is they'll, they'll put their tentacles up or the snail will either drill a hole in the top or he'll get underneath it and he'll try and flip it. And what, what we've seen a lot too is stingrays like to eat OPE. So they'll come right up to the shoreline and I've never seen this. And I don't think, I don't know if anyone's ever seen it, but we know they do that. Um, actually, Chris has probably seen it. We know they do that because when we go to a place that we, no one is supposed to be at, like Mokumanamana, Necker Island in the Northwesterns, you'll see all these upturned opihi shells. And at first we were like, oh my gosh, there's someone coming up here and they're taking all the opihi. And then we're like, no, it's the hihi manu. It's the spotted eagle ray because they come real close to the shoreline. And I don't know how, what they how they do it, but they'll take them and they'll eat them. And then the shell eventually just washes back up or it'll be just be like in a little tide pool. Yeah. And we always wondered if the seabirds ate them, but I don't think they do. I have a question. Um, you mentioned about the, the resettling um, and the specificity of Oahu. Has there any, been any work done or plans for work to look at the, the tides and for the, the currents to look at where some of those protected areas of Oahu protected areas and other Maybe my islands where the larvae will most settle since they don't settle far. They're very island specific. Maybe. Yeah, there's been some initial modeling. There's a lot of researchers that like to do modeling work. And so Chris has some pictures of, and I didn't include them today, of where they think the OPE would settle out. So like Kaena Point would be one place where if you shut Oahu down, Kaena Point OPE will probably come back. And you'd think, well, I always thought the OPE would the library wind up going to Kauai, but he's thinking that it's actually gonna come back into towards Haleiwa. Yeah, and sell back out that way. Yeah, so he does have some of that modeling. He hasn't done a ton of work on it. He's he's more into the genetics right now, but there is some of that that they've started to look at. Yeah, because they've even talked about like, could you seed an area? Could you just like collect eggs and sperm and seed an area and see? That's never been done, but you know, just to, like why not? Like the west side of this island, there's not a lot of OP there. Could you just put it out there and see if they'll settle? You know, that's always a question that that we get about about that. We've never done that though before. Yeah. And do people swallow a bee or do they bite into it? And do you see them or do they eat it raw? They eat it raw. Yeah, they'll eat it raw. Um, yeah, you just eat, it's like, like poke. Like, yeah, no, they'll just crunch it. Yeah, you just eat them. I mean, you can, you could like shoot them like a shooter, I guess. But, yeah, like an oyster. Yeah, you could do that. But yeah, usually they'll just, I mean, the, the ones you can eat, they're relatively big. So sometimes with the koele that are more, um, they're tougher. They'll cut them up and they'll put like, you know, inamona and I'll limu and stuff and they'll make like a poke out of it. Yeah. I haven't heard of anyone cooking OP. Yeah. No, it's a raw thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>